All right. Good morning, everyone. There we go. Let's get our sponsor. Let's try that one more time. Good morning, everyone. All right. What a great day. It's so good to see all of you here at Dalewood Baptist Church this morning. Um, our worship service is a little different than usual because we started outside. We are so excited for Austin and for his family and friends as he's been baptized this morning already. Uh, but now that uh, we've finished our baptism, we're still going to have a time of worship together. Uh, so I'm glad that all of you guys made it outside and made it back in. Um, if you're new with this, I want to invite you. If you have a smartphone, you can scan the QR code there on the screen and just give us a little bit of information about yourself. Or if you don't have a smartphone or don't know how that works, we've got a little card that you could fill out. We'd love to just uh, be able to connect with you after the worship service. So if you don't mind doing that, we would love for you to do that this morning. Uh, but we're just so glad that all of you are here this morning with us, whether you're here in person or you're joining us online. It's great to have all of you with us this morning. So I'm going to walk this way just a little bit, and we're going to start a time of worship together. Uh, so if you'll stand and sing with me, we've got a few songs that we're going to sing, and I'd love for you to stand as we sing and worship together. All right, let's worship together. Sing with me. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning the everlasting arms leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms leaning. week we introduced a new song and we're going to sing it again this morning as Lindsay leads us. I'd love for you to sing with us.
your good. Thank you, Jonathan and Lindsay, for leading us in song as we, uh, I love both of the songs. Really, I looked at the lineup today, and I love all the songs we're singing. So uh, it's a special day, but again, especially special. We're thankful for the baptism of Austin. And uh, today, last Sunday in the church calendar. And uh, if you remember, something uh, big happened on the day of Pentecost. And so I wanted to read that today to kind of guide us in our meditation on uh, what happens when we're baptized, why we're baptized, the significance of that uh, for us. We'll do that several moments throughout the service today as we culminate in the Lord's Supper. I mean, how wonderful to begin a service with a baptism and then to wrap it up with uh, the Lord's Supper together. So uh, if you uh, have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to the book of Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I'm going to be kind of reading different bits throughout uh, uh, for the sake of time, but you see the text on the screen, Acts 2, 1 to 4, 22 through 24, and then 33 through 46. If you would listen, for this is God's word to us. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They start preaching. Things start happening. If you'll look at verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him. In your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Fast forward to verse 33. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this That you yourselves also are seeing and hearing, for David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to heart and said to Peter, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, This is the time in our worship where we pray for needs in our church body. And I wanted to just share a few with you today. One significant one we've been praying for for months and months and months now. And uh, we've gotten worse news as of late. But Janine Hager's nephew, David Hager. Uh, If you know, he has cancer and has had several setbacks recently. He actually went on hospice care uh, on, I believe it was Thursday night. And so we want to pray for Janine and pray for her family uh, today. Uh, He's at home, uh, and that's where he's receiving hospice care. So we want to pray for Janine. Also, this is going to serve as our offertory prayer today. So at the conclusion of this prayer, we'll take up our, uh, Don and Larry will uh, pass the plate. And so uh, we're going to pray for the offering, but also wanted to let you know how you can give. Uh, you can give by putting your money in the offering, or you can go to our website, dalewoodchurchnashville.com slash give. Uh, those are two, two ways you can give here. Uh, but we do want to pray for the needs in our community today. So if you would, please bow your heads with me. Let us go to the Lord now in prayer. Our Father and our God, we come to you today and we, uh, we first, we want to praise you and exalt your name, God, because uh, we have witnessed your salvation, we have witnessed your deliverance. Father, we praise you for the baptism. that you would preserve us as a fellowship, that you would keep us faithful to your word. God, we want to pray today for uh, the needs in our church body, uh, for Uh, But also we want to pray especially for our sister Janine Hager as she is uh, near her nephew now, as as, uh, we know that his days on earth are short. Father, we know that only you know the number of days that we have on this planet. Um, Father, we pray that you would um, just be with David, bless him even in these final days. Uh, Father, he know he is a Christian, he's trusted Jesus, and so I pray that you would help him to f- fixate on his hope. Sister, and help us to serve her and to bless her. Uh, God, we pray for uh, those in our community today. We uh, want to pray for um, God as, as Nashville grows and and. and take advantage of that, Father, for one reason or another, and uh, who the growth is behind people in its tracks. And so we want to pray for those today who, uh, Father, are um, perhaps marginalized or who are not able to take advantage of that, Father. We pray that you would provide for them, God, and that you would help us to be faithful in loving our neighbor as ourself. God, we want to pray for Uh, our church today, and just pray that you would continue to give us fellowship with your Holy Spirit. We know that uh, even more than baptism by water, the most significant baptism is being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so I pray that we would be a body of Christ who exercises our spiritual gifts in love towards one another, that we would bear the fruit of the Spirit, and so give off the fragrance of Jesus Christ, your Son, in all of our interactions with our neighbor. Because, uh, Father, whenever we live in the Spirit by faith, Uh, God in the world, we know that you will uh, communicate the gospel through us to our neighbor. Father, help us to not be bashful or shy about the good news of salvation, but in faithfulness to proclaim it in love. Uh, Father, we want to pray today for our government leaders. We pray for our President Joe Biden, Governor Bill Lee, and Mayor John Cooper. We pray for men and women who serve at any elected or appointed position at any level of government. We ask that you would give them wisdom, Father. We know that the heart of a king is 
like a stream of water in your hands. And so, Father, we pray that you would help them to do justice and to love mercy. And, Father, where there is self-interest or uh, injustice involved, that you would thwart their plan. Uh, Father, we also pray that you would help us to be faithful. God, as we continue now in the worship of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray that you would bless us, Father, for transformation as we take of our tithes and of our offerings in just a moment. We pray that you would bless both the gift and the giver, Father, as we, um, as we render unto you in thanksgiving the gifts which you have already given to us. Father, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. And as we continue to worship together, we're going to sing a song that many of you may know. So as we pass our plate, uh, we'd love for you to sing along with us, and then I'll invite you to stand uh, about halfway through the song as we sing together. In Christ alone. My hope is found, He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, I'm through the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter. My all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. On him was laid, there in the path of Christ I live. Would you stand as we continue to sing together? There in the ground. His body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his. He is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life. No fear in death is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns. Or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand till 
Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand Here in the power of Christ I'll stand If you would, remain standing for the reading of our sermon text today. And if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to Malachi chapter 2. I'm going to be preaching on Malachi 2, 17 through chapter 3, verse 5. The text will also be on the screen, so you can follow along there. Uh, Malachi chapter 2, verse 17 through chapter 3, verse 5. If you would listen, for this is God's word to us. You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker and his wages, the widow, and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner. And do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And uh, if you would bow your heads with me and let us pray. Father, would you speak to us now for your servants are listening. God, we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, many of you know I grew up in East Tennessee, only about a 30-minute drive from Pigeon Forge. Uh, it was kind of shocking to me whenever I moved away from East Tennessee that that was the vacation destination of everybody from within about six hours. They would go to Pigeon Forge uh, as a vacation. And I understand why, because it's a great place. The mountains are beautiful. There's a lot to do. And uh, one of the things that if you've ever been to Pigeon Forge, you've at least seen it. You may have even been there before. There's a place called Wonderworks. It's easy to see because when you drive up to it, you see the Titanic, which is not sunk in the bottom of the Atlantic Oceans, but behold, a replica is sitting right there by the side of the road. And the building itself is interesting because when you look at it, the foundation of the building is actually very high in the sky. And you go down the pillars, not up the pillars, to get to the roof, which is on the ground. Uh, you walk into the lobby and uh, you look up to the ceiling and there's a grand marble staircase going up. And the floor, which is actually the ceiling, is a checkered tile up there. It's upside down. You, it's a little disorienting because you're walking on the roof and you're walking on the ceiling and the ceiling is on... You all know what I'm trying to say. Sometimes life feels that way, doesn't it? It seems like up is down and down is up. And, and we experience that because it seems like the people who get ahead are the people who are cruel, who are lazy, and or ruthless. And the people who are trying hard, it just seems like they get behind. And we, it, it, Complicating all of this is the fact that we believe God is in control. He is the creator. He is the sovereign Lord of the universe. And we wonder... This God who has given us the law, he's told us the blessings and curses for obedience and disobedience, instructing us to live by faith. We wonder, God, why is it this way? Why does it sometimes seem like reality is upside down? You have the ability to punish the evildoer and to bless those who are working in righteousness. Why is it this way? Well, it's not a new conundrum to us. If you've been following along in our series through the book of Malachi, it was a challenge, it was a difficulty that the people of Israel had, right? They were struggling, right? Remember the first word God says in Malachi, I love you? They didn't believe that. 
Living the Christian life was difficult for them. They didn't have the means that they did before. They didn't have any more government subsidies coming their way. And so it was difficult to give the tithe, to be faithful, to adhere to the commandments. They seemed outdated. They seemed antiquated. But God was calling them to be faithful. And moreover, complicating that, there's their teachers weren't helping them at all. The priests, were told, were showing partiality in their instruction. They weren't teaching the law of God as he had given to Moses, but rather they were according to the audience. And third, they were abandoning their fidelity to the Lord, right? Because, and their wives, the men were divorcing their wives because not only of the perils of adultery and the allure of other things, but also it gave them a better social status. If I'm not held down or hampered by this old wife of my youth, then I can climb in the ranks of the social elite in the region where I live that are not Judahites, they're not Israelites, but they are the people of the land. And again, this seems to have shaken their faith in God, and that's why God opens up our passage to today in verse 27. This is the fourth of six disputes God has with the people. And he says, you've wearied the Lord with your words. And they're like, well, how have we wearied you? By saying, this is what they're charging God with. Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. And he delights in them. He delights in the evildoer. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? God, are you going to show up? Well, we, we might be tempted to mock these people who Malachi is criticizing. It's a serious charge. But if we think about it, and as, if we read the Bible, all the biblical writers from Genesis to the maps in our Bible, there are people who are wrestling with this issue. Why do the wicked prosper? And why does it seem like the righteous suffer? In this genre of wisdom literature in the Bible, every Every book kind of wrestles with it in their own way. Job is this righteous man who suffers, and his friends decide, you know what? You wouldn't suffer unless you were doing something bad. And you see the distress that brings to Job. God says that's not true. Or maybe Ecclesiastes, which is trying to figure out how do we cope with this in our life? And basically the answer from Ecclesiastes is keep your head down, be faithful, fear the Lord, and don't worry about other people. He says this. This is the closing verses in the book of Ecclesiastes. This is the end of the matter. All has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. The book of Proverbs tries to take that and to apply it to just a multitude of different situations. And I really want us to think about the book of Psalms, though. Because if you read the book of Psalms, half of the Psalms are actually called lament Psalms. That is, they are voicing a complaint to God, but in prayer, asking that God would act. And so today, I actually want us, as we go through this passage in Malachi, I want us to read Psalm 73, or parts of it today. Because we'll see, how do we respond to God? Whenever we're experiencing this ourselves, whenever we're vexed, by the problem of evil in the world, we can go to the Lord in prayer. And we, while we do that, we want to commit ourselves to the keeping God's honor intact. We don't want to defame his name. But rather, we have to step into the realm of God's mystery with honesty. Being honest with complaints, but making sure that we honor the Lord. As we go through this passage today, I, I don't think I can summarize it better than my Hebrew professor in seminary, Alan Ross, does in his commentary on Malachi. So I just want to read what he said, because I think this is so helpful. The God of justice will send the Lord of the covenant and his messenger to purify his people for spiritual service and to judge unbelievers for their sins. Let me say that one more time. The God of justice will send the Lord of the covenant and his messenger to purify his people for spiritual service and to judge unbelievers for their sins. Well, the first thing we see in our passage today is that God's justice is God's justice is sometimes difficult for us to see. We again, we've mentioned this, but we see the wicked prosper in society. It happens in the news. We see this happen, right? You might think of contemporary examples. NFL quarterback Deshaun Watson accused credibly by 23 women of committing sexual assault, and you think that's got to put him out, right? And then he gets rewarded one of the most lucrative contracts in NFL history, $230 million in guaranteed money. That's $10 million for every woman who's accused him of sexual assault. Guaranteed money. A quarter of a billion dollars. 
right? Or whenever a celebrity admits to sexual assault on video and still gets elected to public office. Whenever you have a coworker who constantly complains about their work, they're lazy, they slander other people, and yet whenever it's time for promotion, they get a promotion and a raise, and you didn't get one this year, even though you're working hard, and you know that you do work as well as they do. Or you think of the local business person who fudges the numbers a little bit with the IRS, They grow in wealth, and the small businessman who's working hard tries to do everything honestly but didn't report something correctly, gets dinged with an audit, and has to pay thousands of dollars in fees and fines. You commit to tell the truth, even when it might hurt you, to your own detriment, and yet you see people who lie get put ahead of you. They go on to succeed. We wonder, how is that just? Where is the justice of that God? Why, if we're trying to be faithful, why are you letting the wicked prosper? Well, the psalmist in Psalm 73 dealt with the same issue. We're told it's a psalm of Asaph. And here's what he wrote. And I want us to read the first 15 verses together. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For, listen... They have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. That means they're well fed. They're not in trouble as others are. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers their garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens. Their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge of the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches, all in vain. Have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence? For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation Is that something that you resonate with? If so, then you understand a little bit of what the psalmist is dealing with. You understand a little bit about the people who Malachi is criticizing felt. And again, I think there's virtue to being honest with God. But there's also virtue in realizing that even if we're honest with God about our confusion, about our complaints, about what we don't understand, we do so in a way that honors him. We don't put the blame on him. We don't slander him to the world. But we are honest. Now, there's two assumptions. The people say, where is the God of justice? They don't think that he's there. Well, that assumes two things, and I want us to challenge each of the assumptions. The first is this, that if somebody does something wrong, then God is going to come immediately and punish them. This is something that, in the book of 2 Peter, he has to address with the people he's writing to. There are false teachers in 2 Peter chapter 3 who are basically saying, look, ever since the beginning of the world, nothing's changed. We don't need to worry about what God's going to do. And and here's Peter's response in 2 Peter 3, verse 8 through 10. Do not overlook this fact, beloved, that the Lord, with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some consider slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with the reward. The heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. What Peter's saying is, don't count God's time like your time. You want him to act swiftly, but don't worry. God will get his justice. In in fact, the fact that God hasn't acted in judgment yet, you know what that's for? It's so that there's a chance to repent. Not even the, we, we sing this in our hymn, the vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. We believe that. And so even though there is horrible wickedness going on in the world, and we do ask and we pray that God would act swiftly against it, we do know that the time that it, of waiting is for repentance. So the first assumption is that God's justice would come immediately. The second assumption is that if God's justice came, we'd be in the right. Right, to quote one Bible commentator, unsettled. 
Whenever God comes, it shakes things up. It's not necessarily safe, but can be dangerous, not just for the wicked, but for us. You see, we're always hesitant. We do this in our life. We're always hesitant to identify ourselves with the wicked, with the weak brother or sister, with the person who has fallen. We always think, or we often think, that we're the righteous. We're the ones in whom the Lord delights. God must be glad with what I'm doing. is that if God comes to judge, everyone is included in that judgment, including you. Not only is his time different from our time, but how God measures justice is different and better than how we would measure justice. And so this informs the next promise that Malachi makes. Not only is God's justice but also God sends messengers to prepare people Lord's coming. God sends messengers to prepare people for the Lord's coming. Look at verse 1 in chapter 3. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of his covenant, in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord. Tells the people that he's going to send someone to prepare the way for his arrival. Build up, prepare the way, remove every obstruction from my people's way. Well, what are the obstacles that prevent people from geography? Is it in the way or there's not a road there? No, it's a spiritual obstruction. They just don't care about the things of God and they're committing evil behavior. They still haven't submitted themselves unto the Lord. And he sends someone to help purify their hearts. Verses 2 and 3 said, like a refiner's fire. That means he's going to burn the metal until all. He's going to not only refine them, he's going to cleanse them and wash them from their sins. And this is a truth of the Testament. If you have your Bible with me, right, open to Malachi, you know, just turn the page over one, maybe two pages, and boom, you're in the New Testament. All right, the four Gospels, Matthew's there, and I actually want to go to the Gospel. written in Isaiah the prophet. And notice he's going to quote Malachi 3.1 before moving to Isaiah 4.40 verse 3. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. That's Malachi 3.1. Isaiah 40 verse 3. The voice of prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Who's the messenger? Mark 1 verse 4. John appeared, John the Baptist, baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism for repentance and for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. I told you I was going to talk about baptism today, didn't I? It's pretty great. So people come forward to be baptized, and the Gospel of Luke elaborates on what John told them. How did he prepare them? How did their confession of sin, how did that... and their before Jesus is even on the scene. What is it doing? Well, look at Luke chapter 3, verse 7 and following. This is what John says. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to free to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have a father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not into the fire. And the crowd said to him, What then shall we do? 
and whoever has food to do likewise. Tax collectors came also to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you're authorized to do. Don't extort the people uh, whom you're collecting taxes from. Soldiers asked to him, And we, what, what shall we do? And he said, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. Basically, as people from different professions come by and they're like, How do we do this? He gives them contextual advice of ways in which they'll be tempted to vocations to dishonor the Lord. And he tells them, Be faithful. Right? These are particular temptations that prevent them from loving their neighbor. The goal is for us to love God and love neighbor. That's always been the goal. And this moral purification, it's in order to prepare us to meet the Lord. Remember what Malachi said? The He's going to purify the sons of Levi, and then the Lord is going to come to his temple in the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Well, look, he goes on to say in John 3, or, sorry, not, not John, Luke. John the Baptist says it. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. See, Jesus, the Lord, he, he's simultaneously the Lord who comes to the temple and the messenger of the covenant, namely the new covenant spoken of by Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36 tells us that there is a new heart that he, the Lord will take and will put into his people and that he will give them a heart of flesh and he will put his spirit within them. So part of the purification that Jesus brings, part of the way we're ready, is not only by being baptized in water, but by receiving and living in the Holy Spirit. And whenever we're in fellowship with God, here's the good thing. Not only does he purify us, but we're told in the New Covenant, he remembers our sins no more. He no longer counts them against us. We can stand before him without fear. The Christian life is for God's sake. And in Psalm 73, we Nevertheless, doesn't matter what happens to the world, nevertheless, listen, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my life and my poor forever. God sends messengers to prepare the way for the Lord's coming. He did it with John. John was a messenger to Israel to prepare them for the coming of Jesus. But he also sent his disciples. The disciples were to go prepare the world, turn of the Lord. And indeed, we as followers of Jesus have the same mission, namely to bear the message of reconciliation, to proclaim the gospel to all nations. As Jesus said, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. So God sends a messenger to call people to repentance, to bring them to the Lord, because when the Lord does come, he will bring judgment on unbelievers. And this is my final point today. God's judgment is reserved for those who do not fear him. God's judgment is reserved for those who do not fear him. Look at verse 5 in Malachi 3. It says, Then I will against the sorcerers. They, you know, that, there were people there who practiced magic and uh, today forms of magic still exist. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, those who are unfaithful to their spouse, against those who swear falsely, who bear a false witness in court against in his wages, the, literally those who withhold wages from the worker who oppress the widow and the fatherless against those who thrust aside the sojourner, the immigrant. And do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. All of the things that are condemned there, they're all summed up in that last phrase, those who do not fear me. Every abomination that we might commit, every act of committing injustice against our neighbor ultimately is rooted in a lack of the fear of the Lord. And again, fear of the Lord, not in the sense of we cower before him and quake, because 1 John 4 says that perfect love in God casts out all fear. But a reverence, what Malachi says in chapter 1, verse 6, if I am a father, 
Where is my honor? If I'm a master, where is my fear? Where is my reverence? Whenever we oppress the people who are the most vulnerable in society, and in the Old Testament, these normally come in a set of three, the widow, the orphan, and the sojourner, or again, we might to use a, a better word for us today, we might say the word immigrant, the non-resident alien. These are the three people who have the least, uh, they're the most vulnerable, they have the least defense, they have the, they have the least amount of advocates for them. A widow doesn't have her husband there to provide for her, to protect her from those, and that she's easy to take advantage of them, as are the orphans who have no children, who have no father. The sojourner has no rights, right? If, even in our country today, if someone doesn't have a green card and they're working in our nation, right, it's a, if, if someone's committing justice against them, they have nowhere to go. They can't go to the government or else they'll be deported and they'll be sent somewhere else. And what the Bible says is if we commit injustice against them, We do not fear the Lord. We are committing an abomination before the Lord. But to all those who do not bow the knee to him, there is a day coming. Remember, God's time is not like our time. There is a day coming which the Lord has appointed when the Lord Jesus will judgment. There's always this simultaneous twofold peace. God will save his people Because God will judge the wicked. Salvation and judgment always go together. Somebody is judged whenever the Lord comes with salvation. And this is what the psalmist looks to in Psalm 73, verse 27 and 28. After coming to grips with adhering to God, despite what happens in the world, he says in verse 27, Behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. It is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge. That the Lord of the covenant and his messenger to purify his people for spiritual service. Jesus has been judged for us. That's what the cross is all about. That Jesus, by going to the cross, was condemned on the tree. Cursed is everybody who hangs on the tree. He endured the judgment of God so that you and I would not have to. And that all who place their faith in him should not but have everlasting life. That's the good news of the gospel. And it's the good news which enables us to stand before God. It's the good news of our salvation. And if you're here today and you've not professed faith in Jesus Christ, well, today is the day of salvation. We've had the privilege of starting the day off with baptism where we've witnessed what's it like for someone to go from death and to raise up to walk in the newness of life. In just a little while, we'll take the Lord's Supper, which is where we remember that whenever Jesus died upon the cross, he gave his body to be broken for us and he poured out his blood for us that we might be forgiven. This is available to all who believe. The invitation to all who have submitted themselves to God in faith and repentance is to come to the table. Come unto Jesus Christ, your Lord, who died for you and who lives for you and who is beckoning you to come unto him. Jonathan's going to come and lead us in a hymn of response. I'll be standing uh, down front to pray with anyone Uh, The microphone's going to be turned off. No one else has to hear our conversation. But if you need to pray about coming to the Lord, if you need to pray about rededicating your life to the Lord, if you need to pray about anything, I'll be standing here and would love to pray with you. So if you would, please bow your head with me now and let us go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you that you are a God of justice. Father, we know that if we come unto that the wrong way, that your justice will be applied to us. But because of your Son, Jesus Christ, our justice is applied to him. And Father, because he died, all of your wrath is swallowed in death, and indeed your love and your victory comes to life in the resurrection of Jesus, one who has ascended to your right hand, and he sits there now, sending his Spirit to us who live here upon the earth. God, we pray that you would help us, as John the Baptist called us to do, the messenger whom the Lord sent, that we would be a people who bear fruit. 
that we would not see our baptism or our entry into the Christian faith as the end of the story, but rather the beginning, God. Continue to live unto righteousness and justice and love of our neighbor all the days of our life, that we would love you, our Lord, with all of our heart. That you would be the strength of our life and our portion for pray, we ask for your justice, but we also pray that you would bring many men into faith in you before that day. God, we pray Christ your Son. Amen. Amen. As we reflect on Ryan's message this morning, let's stand and sing a song together. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready, stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms. And in the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are 10,000 charms. Lost and ruined by the fall. And if you tarry until you're better, you will never come out. Go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms. In the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are ten thousand charms. This is the time in our worship service where we get to take the Lord's Supper together. As Don and Larry pass out the elements in just a moment, uh, the both the the bread and the juice are in the same tray, so make sure you grab one of each. Click on the keyboard. Take this time to just pray to the Lord to thank Him. Spend time with Jesus Christ. And also to meditate upon uh, how we can live in faithfulness to Him. So if you would, please bow your heads with me and let us pray. Uh, we thank you for the death of your son, Jesus Christ, upon the cross, that he gave him that he might have life. God, would you help us to receive these elements? Amen.
Would you please bow your head with me? Heavenly Father, come to this, your table, a merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made and that our souls washed through his most precious blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Uh, early and in the Gospel of Luke, whenever Jesus gives the Lord's Supper, he speaks about that new covenant. And so I want to read this today as we partake of the meal. It says, when the hour came, he reclined at table and his apostles with him. And he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I And when he'd given it, he said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves, for I tell you that I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And whenever he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Well, if you would say this with me, we always want to anticipate, uh, as I mentioned last week, someone called the Lord's Supper the hors d'oeuvres for the wedding supper of the Lamb. And so we always want to anticipate the Lord's return when we do this. So if you would say this with me, Christ has died, Christ has risen, shall come again. Let's say it together. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ shall come again. Amen. Well, I'd like to, again, thank everyone for being here today. It's been me. Uh, before we go, I have a few announcements that I'd like to draw to your attention. Uh, I don't remember what they are, so I'll look on the screen. Uh, the first is that this Wednesday we're continuing our Bible study. Um, on uh, through the Apostles' Creed called What Christians Believe. We're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. So I mentioned that earlier in the sermon and in our scripture reading in the day of Pentecost. Uh, I believe in the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Uh, we'll discuss that at 6 o'clock. We'll meet here in the Christian Life Center in the Fireside Room. Uh, and then we'll have our, our adult Bible study before that. And then that we're not going to have youth group this week. And I wanted to go ahead and put something. I want you to be praying about it. And thinking about it, we'll have envelopes for this next week, but on Father's Day, we always collect an offering for the Tennessee Baptist Adult Homes. This is, these are homes for adults with um, some type of developmental disability or handicap, and so uh, we collect this offering. We will do that in two weeks, so just begin to pray about what the Lord would lead, would lead you to give to that. And I want to do just a couple things uh, before we go. I'm going to invite Austin to come forward to the front. Before I say a word on him, come on up. Uh, I want to just say a a word of thanks to several individuals for today. Uh, First, I want to thank Kenneth Reeder for showing up early today to fill up that baptismal font out front uh, and making sure that we had water to baptize Austin with. So thank you, Kenneth. I want to say a special thanks to Don Pyland and Larry Richardson, uh, who you all saw were very busy today. They helped uh, Austin get clean after the baptism, to, to, get, to, to dry off, that's what I mean. Uh, and they did the Lord's Supper, and they helped set this space up. So I just want to say on the PowerPoint today, uh, as Austin was, uh, had other things to attend to. I just wanted to special say a word of thanks to those men for helping today. And now for Austin, our new, uh, our brother in Christ who has uh, come as baptism. He's also coming to become a member of the church, uh, which he comes by his baptism. So if you would uh, receive Austin into the membership of our church, would you say amen? amen? Amen. Okay, well I told him he has to stand here by the pillar and get all the uh, handshakes and hugs after service today. So Jonathan's going to come lead us in song, but if you would, uh, please bow your heads with me, and let's go to prayer, uh, to the Lord in prayer one more time. 
Heavenly Father, again, wonderful Sunday celebration uh, of the salvation that we have in Jesus. We've witnessed your salvation on display today, and indeed we do every Sunday when we gather. Father, I pray that you would help us this week to live in faith, protect us from illness, keep us from the enemy, and would you bring us once again into these doors of fellowship together. God, we We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Amen. What a great day. I'm so glad each and every one of you were here. Uh, if you haven't met us before, uh, that's Pastor Ryan. I'm Jonathan. We're both so excited that you're here with us. So we'd love to meet you after the service. Um, but as we dismiss, we're going to sing one final song together. So would you stand and let's sing together. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Let's sing together. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, hold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of You're dismissed. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.